Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, there will be dwarves. Uh, no, not yet, unfortunately. I, uh, uh, as uh, Mo Duffy says in the chat, um, there is in progress a uh, coloring book for Event Driven Architecture uh, from Red Hat. And uh, I've been participating a little bit in it, obviously not in the art or in the content, just in the uh, kind of technical review. Uh, smarter and more talented people than I are uh, working on the the actual drawings and the content. Um, so this talk, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so this talk is about uh, event-driven architecture, um, and the way. And then I realized I I messed with the colors yesterday, and so uh, later on uh, there may be some uh, challenges for someone who is blue-green colorblind, which didn't occur to me, and I don't have that affliction, so I uh, apologize in advance if you can't read it. Um, but uh, hopefully my pointing around will uh, will help the uh, solution or will help understand what the picture is. Um, so event-driven architecture under mostly the name like serverless and service mesh, um, and I, those are the two that kind of come to mind most quickly, um, has actually been around for a really long time. Um, there's been, uh, it's kind of funny if you go back to uh, old school Microsoft development um, into what's called COM, which was the component object model. Um, it was actually an event-driven architecture. The way it worked, uh, basically you had a, a thread that was kind of sitting around and it would pick up events and then respond to them. And that was kind of how Windows worked. And then they uh, expanded it to be distributed uh, with the brilliantly named DCOM, uh, which was distributed COM. Uh, and uh, uh, what was I going to say? So, uh, except that distributed only meant within a Windows network. Uh, so that wasn't exactly terribly useful um, for a lot of scenarios. So uh, actually, way back in the day, a friend of mine and I uh, actually built a um, DCOM over HTTP uh, transport layer uh, so that you could still use DCOM uh, in, you know, if you were a Microsoft developer and you had all these tools, like things like Visual Basic and the Visual Studio uh, environment, and they would still work, but over HTTP. So uh, yeah, so keep in mind, Event Driven Architecture has been around for a very long time, um, and we're going to talk about how it works uh, mostly uh, like today, uh, and then I'm going to try to show you some demonstrations of how it works and where it kind of fits. Um, it's a difficult thing to demonstrate. I don't know if you saw the keynote that we did a little while ago. Um, but there's not even great tools out there uh, to kind of understand what's going on in a, you know, kind of a microservices architecture, um, except like one of the code smells that was discussed, for example, was kind of the reduction in the use of something like a service bus. Um, and, you know, the reason for that is because you want to kind of have events kind of going across uh, the entire environment uh, so that you don't have to be limited to, um just the events coming across the bus. So you end up with a kind of a, a very complex, um, you know, and somewhat difficult to understand uh, environments. Uh, and so there's a lot of rapid work uh, going on to try to help people visualize it and understand what's going on. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll get there sooner rather than later. Um, but we're going to show a little bit of, of some of that tool chain as well. Um, and, uh, you know, my timing is a little off. I was expecting this to be a little bit longer talk. Uh, so hopefully I'll, I'll be able to kind of fit everything in and leave some time for some questions. Um, but long story short, on this slide, uh, I wanted to point out that, you know, it's been around for a long time. Uh, sometimes it's gone under other names. So I kind of mentioned COM and DCOM. It wasn't really called event. It was, certainly wasn't called an event-driven architecture. It was referred to as events. Um, and then, uh, you know, things like uh, service-oriented architectures were really going in that direction. Uh, Corba also uh, worked this way, sort of. Um, so kind of like we have a lot of things that are kind of around this problem. Uh, and we really are starting to see it come to fruition. Uh, you know, there's there's not a whole lot of implementations out there, like people who have it in active use, but there are, but the tool chains are there and it's starting to become pretty relevant. Um, so, uh, just kind of, I like to kind of give a broad example of uh, something that has taken place that, you know, kind of illustrates whatever I, I try to be talking about. So, uh, 
And the time for a story, once upon a time, many years ago in my personal career, obviously um, all names will be held to protect the innocent. Um, we had a project, I was working as a software consultant at the time, and we had a project where um, all uh, our customer had a problem where their managers had to do all these different kinds of what were referred to as just approvals. Um, and if you're in a manager in basically any organization, you probably have this experience, right? You have to approve, you know, vacation time, you have to approve invoices, you have to approve expenses, um, all these things. And nine times out of 10, they're in 40 different applications. Um, or it's in, you know, Oracle apps, and it's just a horrific experience anyway. Um, so when we talk about, you um, this you know project what the challenge to us as a consulting organization was was to how can we simplify the user experience for all these managers and when i say all these managers this company um i say fortune 500 but um you know i think they had in the division we worked it with uh 30 000 employees give or take so pretty big company um so we went towards an event-driven architecture, basically. So what could we do, right? Um, and so, well, okay, we could build a whole new application that does the approvals for all these things. Okay, that's got a whole bunch of problems with it, right? So basically greenfield applications, as they're referred to, um, is when you go and like build something brand new to solve a problem. Greenfield applications tend to be the riskiest kinds of projects to take on because they are expensive. Um, they are often, particularly pre like agile methods, um, have a very high kind of expense curve before they actually result in anything. Um, and so they tend to be really, really risky risky um, and consulting companies don't really like doing really, really risky projects because that means you don't get more projects. Um, so uh, we wanted to shy away from that. Our customer also wanted to shy away from that. Um, so another solution is uh, to go to SSO solutions. And so a single sign-on service would simplify at least the access to these, you know, literally 20 something applications, um, which would be nice but doesn't necessarily meet the kind of full kind of user experience needs. Sorry. And then lastly, and this is going to further date myself, um, uh, one of the proposals and one of the very popular solutions to this kind of problem at the time was a tool chain called a portal. And what this was, was basically, you know, imagine an application, you know, web application that's like just a whole bunch of square iframes, right? And then there's all these individual applications behind it. And then you kind of go and click on one of the squares and you might be able to do one little interaction on that first square, but normally you would go and click into it and then it would actually take you kind of into that application. But the idea was you kind of have the SSO component. So it's a single sign on, but it's also kind of surfacing each app all in the same user experience. Lots and lots of problems with that. That's why they eventually died. Um, but you know, they, they, they you know, worked, um, you know, it's just, it was kind of tough. So moving on. Um, well, so we can think about using events. Okay. Well, so first of all, what do we mean by an event? <clears throat> and as you can see here, clearly we must be talking about a, um, you know, a rock concert, right? Is uh, that's an event. Um, but in fact, we aren't really calling that. Um, we are talking about things that, you know, kind of trigger a response. And so when we say an event, um, you know, if you think about it, there's lots of events in the real world, right? You have lights changing, you have, um, you know, turning a light switch on and off is an event, um, you know, trying to trigger the crosswalk is an event. As far as I'm concerned, I think hitting that button doesn't really do anything except make you feel better. It's kind of like the uh, closed door button in an elevator just doesn't seem to actually cause any change. Um, so we have several different types of events when we talk about technology um, events. Uh, and uh, there's actually some references at the end of this deck if you wanna kind of go read more about it. Um, and I'll share the deck in the uh, Discord room after the session's over. Um, so an event notification. So this is kind of like a light switch, like or how a light switch feels, even though it's 
not actually working this way in practice, um, but it's just the notification. So this thing took place. It doesn't necessarily carry any information in the event itself. So it's just the notification. Um, and then another type of event is what's called an event carried state transfer. Um, and this is the trigger, but also all the information about the event, right? So, um, you know, so the event, and so the difference between these two, right, is that the all of the information that you might need to process the event is carried in the event itself. But obviously the event itself is then a much bigger payload. So you have to have a different kind of channel to deliver it. So there's trade-offs between which type you wanna use. Um, and then the last kind of term is event sourcing. Um, and this is where you have a state change event um, but the key to this is that they're serial. And so the state change events must be processed in order um, as well as the, they have the, the benefit of if you run the same order of events again, you will end up in the same state. So these are, I think, the ones identified by Martin Fowler uh, a, like a bunch of years ago, um, and I referenced the article at the end. Um, and so just to kind of give you some language to talk about uh, the different events or event types really. Um, now let's talk a little bit about this kind of going back to the story of our, our little example system, right? So when we walk in the door, um, we say, okay, well, you have this expense system, you have this invoice system, you have all these different systems. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna put an interface into those systems, um, you know, somewhere in touching the business layer. So if you look at this picture kind of here, you know, if you notice when we build that expense listener, we don't build it going against that first tier of a three tier architecture. Uh, we put it instead into the business tier of that architecture. So uh, in other words, all the business logic should be encapsulated right in kind of that middle layer and so if we call into that middle layer we'll have the advantage of the business logic without having to fight through things like html screen scraping etc um, we can do that and it's awful um, but when you don't have control over the system for example sometimes when you're trying to build something like this you don't actually have access to the business layer right there is no api there uh, so in this particular case for this particular project uh, for some of them we actually had to kind of build the business layer uh, or build the api into the business layer so we did that um, and then we built these listeners out in front of it uh, so that we could fire events into the listeners and then transfer them into the appropriate system to do the appropriate thing whatever that might be um, the other thing what we wanted to do was uh, as again any manager knows right um, this is the what feels to be a lot of the time the least critical part of your job right nine times out of ten you're trying to put out a fire you know you are trying to maybe actually sometimes you actually have to deliver on your own kind of individual contributor work you know all these different things and so approving an expense seems like a, just overhead right it's such a pain in the butt to do you have to do it all the time but in fact, for the person who's receiving the expense, right, it's very, very critical. So what we wanted to also build into this system was the ability to um, kind of fire and forget, right? So uh, once you clicked the button that said approve of that expense, we wanted to guarantee that it would make it over there. So now the thing is, is that once we kind of start to build an architecture like this, then we can start to extend our system uh, in really interesting ways um, by introducing new kinds of events. Let's say, you know, you, as your organization grows, I, I, the, basically the, the types of approvals and the number of approvals goes up, right? Um, so, you know, many people, again, kind of more in management than in individual contributor levels, they'll have like a budget approval uh, process, right? They have, you know, $5 that they get to spend, um, you know, over the course of a year. So that way uh, they can build uh, or they they may need to be able to approve that budget where it's going to be allocated, et cetera. Um, and so what we can do though, is that we can start to add new listeners into that same business logic system and keep them independent. And hey, look, now we're starting to have microservices, right? We're starting to have, um, you know, all these different kinds of things that we can start to 
then get even more interesting because what we can next do and we start to drive off of this event driven state and off of this microservice architecture we can actually throw out the user experience component of our expense system. We can stop maintaining it. So we have one less piece of software we have to deal with because nobody's using it, right? They're all going through this kind of shared front end because the user experience is better. Um, and then it's just firing the triggers into the actual system. So you can slowly retire the kind of UI aspect of those systems. And, or at least this is what we did, right? But so these are some of the advantages you get to driving through into this kind of event driven architectures. Um, and so in particular, I think uh, service mesh uh, talks about this particular um, uh, kind of aspect or role or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, that I'm kind of giving examples of here where what we can do is we can, you know, kind of make an actual application look like this picture, right? We can actually look at how those expenses, or, sorry, how those events are traveling through our system. Um, and given that we don't have a lot of time left, um, you know, I'm just going to kind of mention, you know, it also in, uh, encourages even more feature set when you start to think about your architecture being an event driven one is you can start to do canary rollouts, which is when you say, okay, only a portion of my team is, or sorry, only a portion of my customers, whether that's internal managers or actual customers uh, would get a, uh, you know, this new version of the application while you try it out and make it, see if you can make it work. Um, you know, all these different kind of features that start to roll out. Um, and so assuming the demo gods will favor us, um, I will try to show you an example of this in um, OpenShift. This one, maybe? All right. And so uh with the kind of uh, so service mesh is not only a concept but it also happens to be something we ship we ship a product called openshift service mesh it is actually based on uh, a set of upstream projects called istio um, and kiali and jaeger um, and while the real work in a sense is being done by Istio, uh, which is what is actually allowing for this pretty picture to occur or the slides that I was showing you a minute ago to occur. Um, it doesn't visualize it, right? It just says, uh, you know, it's it's doing all the stuff in the background, right? Um, so what Kiali does is lets you visualize that experience um, and also do some level of interaction with that experience as well. Um, but Importantly, um, and I'm going to see if I can make this any bigger for you all. Um, and so we can do cool things like, I don't know if that helps. Um, Just a friendly reminder yes, that sir. you have uh, seven minutes left, okay? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I saw your 10 minute warning. Um, I have been doing a, a Twitch show uh, for the past, I don't know, Actually, it's quite a long time now, six or eight months. Uh, and so I've gotten very good at reading the chat while talking. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's kind of funny. Um, but uh, what you can see here is we can actually do traffic animation, right? And I actually have traffic going through here. Um, and I think I'm going to run out of time on, on trying to uh, move it around too much or whatever. But, you know, the idea of we have all these different events that are taking place um, that are passing through the system. Um, let me slow, let me slow it down a little bit, or it's, it's just going pretty fast. Um, so <clears throat> the events are going through the system, and then we have... Um, uh, the ability to kind of rearrange how some of these different components work. So if you notice, there's a V1 of this recommendation engine. Okay, well, what if I want to introduce V2? Well, I can introduce a V2, and in the canary rollout that we were talking about, we can say, okay, let's move 5% of the traffic there uh, while we make sure that it actually works. Or we have a V2, but we're not actually sure if V2 is better than the old version. So why don't we do what's called uh, red-black testing or blue-green testing um, and, uh, you know, and kind of just share the, uh, and sorry, and um, see if the 
characteristics of the users change based on which one they land in. Uh, one of the classic examples of this, which I thought was super awesome, was um, I think the Hillary Clinton campaign when she ran for president, um, they did a system where they did an AB test uh, or a red black test. They're basically all very similar, but um, depending on what layer they're in, they get a different name sometimes. Um, but they did a different testing with different uh, size buttons around their donation. And they had a material impact in their do donation dollars when they change the size of the button. Um, I think the bu button size increased. Um, but as you can see, like I can now, uh, using an event driven architecture, I can introduce new things anywhere in this pipeline. Um, and like I said, I, I miss I was thinking we had the, the longer session. Um, so I was going to try to demo moving some of these things around. Um, but you know, this is kind of the idea. You can find lots of other demos of this uh, going on. Um, and so I wanted to kind of move, I'll move back to the slides quickly because um, we are almost out of time. Um, and do, 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 do. sorry. Um, just because I also like to give the attributions for the pictures I used, um, but then the references and kind of further reading, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, this is, this is interesting enough for you to go and, uh, you know, go and check out uh, some of this background. Uh, Martin Fowler, if you're unfamiliar, is, you know, a real thought leader in, um, you know, technology in general or software development in general. Um, and so his stuff is really interesting, um, but can be very dense. So, uh, you know, I, I hope, uh, I hope you find some of these things useful. Like I said, I'll share the slides afterwards. You don't have to like take a picture or something like that. Um, and uh, let me flip it over to say, you know, do we have any questions? Is there anyone who uh, wanted to talk about something? Well, I hope that gave you, um, you know, a decent, oh, well, I could talk a little bit more about serverless. So um, let me, so, so the serverless part of it is what we're having here. And I didn't mention the kind of word, but the serverless aspect is really, you're just creating this thing over here, right? Because the serverless system it's not really serverless. It's a fire and forget operation um, that happens to take place on a server, but you don't experience it. You don't have to maintain it or whatever. So as soon as you organize your company around kind of this expense component, let's say it's the expense listener, the budget listener, the elite response, all kind of independently, um, they are just triggerable events, right? And serverless is just kind of, it, you know, in my opinion, right, uh, a kind of a fancy way of talking about um, doing a an event response in a way that you don't have to uh, kind of manage any of the infrastructure that's behind it. Um, so, while you'll see things like lambda and such as ways to um and lambda and such as ways to uh kind of implement this thing really it's the concept that matters right it's that you're firing off an event and it's it's causing things to happen so the next question there is uh can we have serverless with state you can it's much more expensive or it can be more expensive. Uh, so in the current implementations that you see in things like Lambda or in Knative or um, you know any of those solutions, you generally speaking are gonna wanna store your state in some sort of backend, right? So in some sort of database. Um, however, using one of the methods that we talked about early on where you, um, you can actually carry your state along with your event. Um, so, so it depends on what you mean with having serverless with state. Um, generally speaking, uh, pushing as much of that information to the client uh, is a good idea, but it isn't always possible. So stateless, always better. Stateful can be done um, and sometimes can be pushed to the client. Um, you know, if you see well executed, like single page websites, uh, you will actually have these massive cookies or even the client side data store uh, in the browser itself, which is actually usually carrying state. The thing is, then you also have to introduce things like encryption and security and stuff like that because you don't want to have any dangerous data there. So 
hopefully that answered the question. Hopefully I gave you a brief introduction to, to why you might want to take a look into event-driven architectures um, implemented with, you know, service meshes or serverless uh, microservices, uh, you know, microservices in general. And uh, hopefully uh, that uh, convinced you. Um, and we are officially, I think, out of time. Uh, yes, you are, Langdon. So sp spot on that. So this is a, a, a fascinating topic. Um, unfortunately, we didn't give you enough time, I think. But yeah, I totally, I uh, you know, honestly, I, I misread it originally and well, thought it was a, they, one they, of the 40 They always say, you know, talks. leave the room oh, so. with them wanting more. So I think you've done that. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I hope so. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I said, I'll, I'll be in the Discord uh, probably for the rest of DevConf, but um, I currently have session room one open, um, but feel free to tag me. Um, and I do not have a longer version of this talk because this is the first time I gave it. Um, my plan is uh, to kind of keep building it out, in fact, uh, because I have a number of internal like Red Hat people who I'm trying to give this talk to, and I want to do both a short version and a long version. Well, so uh, I would, wait I would, see. I would welcome that. Um, I think it's a, it's a fascinating topic, and you're a wealth of knowledge. So thank you very much uh, for the session. Thank you very much for uh, continuing to monitor Discord so people have a lot of questions. They can find you there, and uh, I wish everyone a good day. And uh, stay tuned at 4.30 Central European time. For Kubernetes Native with Microprop on Quarkus, presented by Roberto Cortez.